בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We're back, ברוך השם, continuing, continuing a series of the Jewish Ashkafa, Jewish ideology, which is really going to discuss Jewish wisdom, and really what is a Chacham. Uh, tonight's show is for the Refua uh, Shlema, for uh, Rabbanit Sara Bat Anat, Rav Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit uh, Levana Bat Sara, um, אבי מורי דוד בן אסריה, אמי מורתי דוריס בת ז'ורה, עובדיה בן דוריס, בן לבנה, תומוסט, שהיא אוהבת אותו כל כך, ובעזרת השם, כל האנשים הרגשים שמתחילים לראות את השיעורים, בין יהודים וג'נטלס, שמתחילים לראות, שמתחילים לראות, במקום להתחיל את המסנג'ר, כי בגלל ש... what uh, people want to say and would like to say, the message is simply not going to change because it's not my own message. It's simply the Torah Kedusha. Uh, so uh, tonight, well, as I said, we're going to continue the series of the Jewish Ashkafa and really try to get a uh, hold on. Uh, what is a Chacham? What is a Chacham? People say, uh, you know, this guy is a Chacham, you know, which means wise. In the world of Torah, it means someone that has... Torah knowledge, uh, but uh, what is a chacham? You know, because if someone is a chacham, and uh, let's say you're not a chacham, then it would be logical that you would not dispute someone that is wiser than you. Just like if you had a uh, certain uh, expertise in, let's say, fixing mufflers or uh, or fixing jet engines. And a uh, doctor or a chemist, a uh, biologist or uh, archaeologist came to you and told you about their expertise, you would not uh, go and uh, reject what they're saying because it's not your expertise. But as we see, while in the world of medicine, archaeology, law, and many other fields, uh, generally people are uh, very... Uh, Uh, scared to uh, to uh, uh, go against the uh, experts. People hold by the experts, even if they don't really know what an expert is, as we saw from the whole uh, debacle of the coronavirus and the vaccines and all the other uh, craziness that happened during that uh, those couple of years of uh, of confusion. But in the world of Torah, it's always been the case where. Uh, people thought that they knew a lot more than the experts, meaning the Chachamim. Now, this is not only uh, something that uh, leads people to you know, bad places like heresy and atheism and all types of uh, other things that uh, certainly are uh, the worst of the worst, but it even leads people to simply having a bad life. Simply having a bad life, unnecessary stress, unnecessary anxiety, Uh, terrible uh, series of decisions uh, which uh, they could literally uh, live without if they so understand what is a Chacham. Now, on the other hand, not everyone that is a, uh, says they're a Chacham is uh, really a Chacham. Quite frankly, anyone that does, you know, uh, I guess... Uh, is uh, arrogant about their knowledge, uh, you know, or, or perhaps even uh, presents themselves as all-knowing, uh, is usually uh, not someone you want to listen to, even if they are a Chacham. Even if they are a Chacham, as the Gemara says, uh, that a Talmit uh, Chacham that has bad character trait, a Nevela Sucha Tova Mimenu, a dead animal in the middle of the street, is better than him. So certainly we need to know who to listen to why we should listen to them, and quite frankly, if we have a say, if we could simply reject. Now, the next question we have to also answer is, is that only, let's say, for example, you agree that uh, when it comes to Torah advice and you want to know how to do a mitzvah, how to dip your utensils in the mikveh, when to dip them, if you should dip them, you know, the, the, the dairy spoon touched some meat, or the meat spoon was dipped in a bunch of milk, uh, you know, and perhaps, you know, you should throw it out, maybe you should burn it, maybe you should dip it in hot water, what do you do? So you ask the chacham, you ask the chacham, 
the uh, the the, uh, the chicken you just bought has a questionable kashrut on it. The uh, the meat that you bought is not uh, you know is glut, but it's not chalak in your safari. You know, so you figure, okay, so this I asked the chacham, and uh, they are gonna know. Fine, fine, that's no problem. But well, when it comes to business advice, marriage advice, uh, uh, issues, legal advice. That's not the field of the Chachamim. Building a building, archaeology, construction. No, Chachamim uh, don't know any of that. Or at least, that's what people think. And this is one of the things that a person needs to know, really, at the very least, to know if they know what is a Chacham. And really, is it someone that is famous, uh, for having Ruach HaKodesh or, or, or almost like prophecy and him I'll listen to anything he says but the local rabbi that studies Torah all day nah, him not so much he's good for the, uh, the utensils which one do I listen to which one do I don't listen to why do I need to even know all of this because once I know what is a Chacham then I will know how to address certain issues that are pertinent in our lives today. And I'll give you just, you know, sometimes we make a lecture and uh, Baruch Hashem, we see the comments, everybody likes it, thank you very much, you changed my life, fantastic. I don't really learn much from there uh, because I see that people like it, fantastic, good. I'm happy that people like it, I'm happy that people are inspired, but I don't learn anything new from there. You know, if you like it, it's not me anyway, it's the Torah. Usually I learn from the people who don't like it. Why? I either know whether it's effective because they don't like it without really giving a reason or a valid reason. Just simply saying, no, I don't believe this. That's not a valid reason. Or so I know it's obviously effective. On the other hand, someone will say something that from there I learn, I miss the point. I missed the point I either did not explain myself well enough or perhaps maybe they made the mistake and they didn't le- listen, but we missed each other. The message did not get delivered to the recipient. And from there I learned. So I tell you, since last week, we made a lecture about converts. And a famous statement in the Gemara that's mentioned multiple times, one of them being in the Gemara in Masechet uh, uh, Nida. It's also mentioned in uh, several other places. But uh, the statement is that uh, converts are like a skin disease to Am Yisrael. Now, of course, if you just read that comment, like one person who commented did, if you just read that title, without actually watching the lecture, if you are a convert or somebody that wants to convert, you would immediately be offended. It's even more interesting that no convert actually said anything like that. Who said something like that? A Jew that was born a Jew and never had to convert. He said, you know, I think your mess, your your uh, your uh, this year is going to offend people. It's going to offend the convert. Now, obviously, if you actually watch the lecture, you'd realize that there's nothing offensive about it. This is a statement in the Gemara. If you're offended by a statement in the Gemara, you do not believe in Judaism. You believe in something else. Why? There's no room for being offended in the Gemara. There's no room for being offended by the Torah. Torah is the word of God. He said it, that means it's right. You think otherwise, you're wrong. That's simple. So, other people will look at that lecture, listen to it, see, wait, he's not talking about all converts as if the good ones and the bad ones. He's talking about He's not talking about just the, the, the good, you know, he's talking about a specific statement that is saying the good ones are a skin disease because 
they are making the Jew that's not doing as good as he should, as far as the servitude of Hashem, he's making him feel bad. So that's a good thing. That's a compliment for the convert. The bad ones, the bad converts, the statement is said about them because they are a problem because they end up being some of the most problematic parts of our nation, as we know from Mount Sinai that we lear- learned about last week and the Erev Rav, they were all converts. So anyone that watched the lecture understood the message, but at least that I would hope. We still saw some other messages in different places. Some were sent to me, some were stated online. And from these messages, I see that some people have missed the point. And these are some of the messages I got. I want to convert ASAP. This person missed the message. I'll tell you why in a second, but someone says, I want to convert right away. Another one said, I wish conversion was done on the spot like in the past. He missed the message. Or she, whoever said this. Another one said, because I want to convert so much, but I'm not ready yet for different reasons. The local people here, the rabbis apparently of wherever this person lives, have decided to call me Gershenit Gayil instead of a Noahide. In so many words, they invented a new so-called Torah terminology for this person. Because he's not a Jew yet, therefore he hasn't converted, he can't be called a righteous gear, a convert, a Jew, can't be called any of that. And he doesn't like being called a Noahide. Not really sure why. Noah was a pretty big tzaddik. But he wants to be called a Gershenit Gayel, someone that is in essence on the way to convert. Problem. I've spoken to a few experts. I myself have spent the last decade dealing with hundreds and hundreds of converts, Baruch Hashem, and none of us have ever heard this. None of us have ever heard this terminology of Gershenit Gayel. It's actually incorrect because Gershenit Gayel means a convert that converted. Doesn't make any sense. Gershemit Gayel, it's a convert that is converting, also doesn't make any sense. Why? Because either you're a Ger Tzedek, meaning you converted, or you are a Noahide, or at the time of Yeshua Benun, you were a Ger Toshav, because you lived in Israel, but that's no longer available. So, not really sure why we're pacifying non-Jews that have a desire to convert, but haven't converted, and changing our Torah for them. This person did not get the message, and it, neither does his rabbis, whoever is calling them this, this new terminology. Another one said, I disagree with the rabbi and don't want to learn from anyone. Oh, don't want to learn from him anymore. This is a person that disagreed, not with me, with somebody else actually. But it is very much applicable to this because I'm sure somebody disagreed with what I said at some point, if not that lecture, something else. And what happens is, is that people, they can learn with somebody for a year, two years, five years, ten years. And then one day that... Chacham will tell them something that he learned in the Torah and they disagree or he tells them his opinion about something and they disagree. He tells them the way he follows Allah and they disagree, which happens. The more you learn with somebody, the more you'll see that there are times that you're not exactly on a, uh, the, same, uh, the same page, but that's okay. 
But no, people say, no, no, no. He disagrees with me. It's so obvious to me that he's wrong. I don't want to learn with him anymore. Is that right? Is that wrong? There are times that's right. There are times that's wrong. Generally speaking, it's more often that it's wrong than it's right. And we'll talk about that. Last but not least, was a completely, completely um, missed the boat on this one, where someone heard one of my shulim, whether it was the one from last week or the one we made uh, in the past about, you know, different types of uh, gilgulim, reincarnations, and we said, you know, in the name of the Arizal, that uh, one of the punishments, it's not always the punishment, it's just one of the punishments for a Jew that marries a non-Jew is that they get reincarnated as a dog, they get reincarnated as other animals, and also they could be reincarnated as a non-Jew with their tikkun being to convert. Meaning, it's not always this, it's not always that. It could be a combination thereof. But needless to say, this is one of the punishments, this is part of the tikkunim. Now this person understood this message almost like the person that says, I want to convert right away. Whereas, I want something and therefore I'm going to decide how to interpret this in order to fit my something. I want to go and marry this or date this Jewish person. I'm not currently Jewish, but if the rabbi said in a, in a lecture, in a shiur Torah, that in the name of the Arizal, from nearly 500 years ago, that it's possible that I maybe was a Jew and I got reincarnated as a non-Jew, in order for me to convert, then technically what I am right now is just a wicked Jew that in order for me to be righteous, I have to be converted. So in so many words, I'm really Jewish. This is by far one of the most abnormal distortion of words I've seen in a long time. But nonetheless, you can't fault people when their desires are causing them to decide things rather than that Torah which they don't possess yet even if they watched a thousand lectures so the question is who has that Torah and sir Chacham a Chacham has that Torah but who is a Chacham who is a Chacham let's see we have to go nearly a half a century back to the words of the Chazonish that will give us some understanding, some clarification of what is a Chacham, what does he look like, what does he say, and then follow his instructions. In the last several lectures of this particular series, the Chazonish has helped us understand the extraordinary level of wisdom that Chachamim have. Whether it's scientific knowledge or it's medicinal knowledge or all types of things that are beyond our comprehension. They possess technology that was in some cases superior to what we have available today in our modern day artificial intelligence world, it's still not what Shlomo HaMelech had 3,000 years ago. And Shlomo was known and noted as the wisest of all men. He's, the Gemara says in Masechet Megillah, all men, but not including Moshe, because Moshe is not in essence considered like any other man, aside from being the prophet of all prophets. He was also in essence, considered as if he was half angel, half man. But this does not minimize the wisdom of Shlomo, as we will discuss. A 
aside from the book of medicines that he wrote and all of the wonderful things that he did, we're going to learn a little more about him. Other things that Shlomo Melech says because if he was a Chacham, we want to learn from him. Says the Chazonish, in Sefer Melachim, the book of Kings 1, chapter 5, verse 10, it says, and the wisdom of Shlomo was greater than the wisdom of all of the sons of the East and all of the wisdom of Egypt. And in verse number 13, in the same chapter, it says, and he, meaning Shlomo Amelech, spoke of the trees from the cedar that was in Lebanon to the moss growing on the wall. And he spoke of the animals and of the birds and of the reptiles and of the fishes. Rashi, from 900 years ago, explains what this all means. Shlomo HaMelech knew the healing qualities of each one. Each one of the trees, each one of the animals, the birds, the reptiles, he knew their healing qualities. And that certain trees were good for certain types of buildings. This is why later on in verse number 15, anyone that looks in will see that Shlomo Melech reconnects with a family friend, his father's friend, Hiram. Hiram Melech Tzu, who initially was a righteous person. Chachamim say that he lived over a thousand years. He was the friend of Yehuda. Yehuda, that was the son of Yaakov. And he was still alive here. He was friends of David Melech. And he became friends with Shlomo. And he, Shlomo Melech told him, I need the trees that you possess. Why? Because I know the wisdom that God gave me that the trees that you possess are the best trees to build the Bet HaMikdash that HaKadosh Baruch Hu commanded us to build. I'll give you any price you want and they made a very big deal. Shlomo HaMelech turned Hiram into richer than rich. The billionaires of the world today would literally look like poor people next to what Hiram had. He had a city of gold where everything was gold. Obnoxious wealth, which unfortunately hurt him in the end. But at this point, Hiram was righteous. And Hiram was very happy to deliver this. And this was a multi-year deal. Shlomo Melech knew about these trees. He also knew where is the best place to plant different types of seeds. So much so that the Midrash tells us Shlomo Melech literally had knowledge of where the root to every single plant and fruit that grows all over the world, where the root of that tree, that plant, that fruit, that vegetable, whatever it is, where that root is leading to in Yerushalayim, meaning everything in the world leads to a certain part of the soil in Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem. And Shlomo HaMelech, through his extraordinary wisdom, knew the exact spot and was able to plant every type of tree, every type of fruit, every type of everything in Yerushalayim. This is literally unbelievable. One of the things the Gemara in Masechet Yoma tells us that Shlomo HaMelech had trees of gold. Not trees that were made of gold where he took some gold, got some experts to shape it like a tree and some fruits. No, a tree of gold. Literally, he actually planted something, a tree of gold, bringing gold fruits. That they would, the Kohanim would live off of, became wealthy off of, take the fruits, and then a tree grew it again. More fruits. A real tree of gold. This is the wisdom of Shlomo Melech. I think I know where the tree is, but I'm not telling you guys. 
Only if you subscribe. Anyway, Shlomo HaMelech knew the best place to plant these trees. Shlomo HaMelech knew everything regarding the animals. What cures the animal? What kills the animal? What can you use the animal for? How to heal them? And the principle of raising and feeding the animals. See so here the Chazonish tells us another example of someone that is not just a Chacham, but someone that is unbelievably smart, unbelievably wise. Of course, there's no one in the world that's like him, but that does not mean that there isn't other Chachamim. Because those that learn from and like the Chacham could ultimately become a Chacham. Now, it's important for a person to first know what is a Chacham in order to know what it entails. What it entails. Now first, we have to go and follow the directions of the Chazonish. He gave us some statements, we're impressed, but he left us some footsteps. He left us a map. He gave us some verses. Those verses will teach us more. The first one that he brings is in Sefer Melachim. Sefer Melachim, Book of Kings 1, chapter 5, verse number 10. It starts really at verse number 9 to give it a little bit more context. Says God gave wisdom and considerable understanding to Shlomo, and the breadth of heart, as immense as the sand, which is upon the seashore. Shlomo's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the east and all the pe- wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than all men, than Eitan the Israelite. Then Haman and Kalkol and Darda and the son of Machol, his fame spread all over the nations around him. He spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs were 1,005. He spoke of the trees from the cedar which is in Lebanon down to the hyssop which grows out of the wall. He spoke of animal, of fowl, of crawling creatures, of fish. They came from all the nations to hear the wisdom of Shlomo, emissaries from all of the kings of the land who had heard of his wisdom. So here we see the same thing that the Chazuni said with a little bit more context from before and after adding a few verses to it. Okay. Now, Vaitene Elohim Chochma, God gave wisdom means the Malbim explains it that wisdom is referring not just to knowledge that you study from books knowledge that you study from experience expertise but rather this wisdom is referring to Shlomo HaMelech's ability to choose between conflicting character traits where he knew that it's humble to be wise to be arrogant is foolish to love is wise and to hate is foolish to be kind is wise to be cruel is foolish and so on Shlomo HaMelech didn't just have the traditional wisdom from books 
and from all types of expertise and knowledge, but he had what's called Chokhmat Alev. He had a complete control of his character traits, of his inclinations, and he knew how to channel them perfectly. He had wisdom of the heart. This is wisdom of the character traits, how to behave and how to deal with other people. He was the master communicator and he knew exactly how to deal with everyone. But he was also given Bina. Not just the Chokhmat Alev, but he also had extraordinary branches of knowledge and the Tvuna that he had was his ability to assimilate and utilize the entire corpus of knowledge and understanding that he had in order to draw conclusions from things that seemed unrelated. So here already we're seeing the mental behavior of a chacham is not just giving you information that they read in a book, but rather, first and foremost, knowing how to deal with different people that are under different circumstances, and also knowing how to deal with every circumstance, not just based on the basic black and white what's in front of you in the book, but rather being able to connect what seems to be unrelated points in order to conclude something. A good example of that is brought up by Rabbeinu Yonah. Rabbeinu Yonah, one of the family members of the Ramban, wrote Sharet Tshuva about 700 years ago. One of the most important Musar Sfarim that exists in the world. And he has a perfect example of something that seems unrelated. And he says in the third gate, section number 80, there's a law in the Torah, in the book of Vaikra, Leviticus, chapter 18, verse number 6, where it says, Ish, ish, el kol she'er besaro lo tikrevu. No man may come close to any of his close relatives to uncover her nakedness. All physical closeness is forbidden such as touching the hands of a married woman. Even though it's referring to close relatives. This is, this is, our Chachamim are explaining that this is referring to any married woman, even if she's not your close relative. How do they know this? It's forbidden any physical clothes is forbidden, such as touching the hands of a married woman to, uh, to uncover her nakedness means to explain that such physical closeness leads to illicit relations. Now, if you were to ask where else in the verses of the Torah, the Psukim, do we find that the Torah actually instru- instituted a precautionary measure that could justify saying that this verse too prohibits one's hand from touching another's as a precautionary measure against sin? In so many words, where'd you guys get this from? The verse says, no man should come close to any of his close relatives to uncover our nakedness. Okay, don't go to your sister or mother and so on. Fine. But you, the Chachamim, you're saying, don't go to any married woman, get close to her, 
any woman that's forbidden to you, close to, oh, where did you, it didn't say that in the verses. Where did you guys get this from? Are you guys inventing things? The rabbis, rabbinical Judaism, right? That's people that don't know what a chacham is. Says Rabbeinu Yonah, says Rabbeinu Yonah, 700 years ago, clear as day, says we learn Torah from Torah. We learn Torah from Torah. HaKadosh Baruch can't spell out every single thing that Avraham Avinu did from the moment that he was born until he was three years old, until he was four years old, until he was 10 years old, until he was 30 years old, 100 years old. He couldn't do that. Why? Because the Sefer Torah would be a million books and not just the life of Avraham. HaKadosh Baruch could not do every single detail of every single mitzvah because why? Every mitzvah would be countless books. So we learn Torah from the Torah. How do we know we can do this? Because one of the things that we got at Mount Sinai is the oral Torah. And the most extraordinary part of the oral Torah was the rules of the Torah. How? to interpret the Torah. And therefore the Chachamim that are using these hermeneutical rules are saying to us, we learn Torah from Torah. You see that the verse says, don't go to your relative to do bad things, to do forbidden things. Chachamim see, no, 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 no. This doesn't mean just relatives. It means every married woman, it means someone that is you're forbidden to be with. And this is from the Torah, not rabbinic. Where do you see this? Ben Yonah says, there's a verse. There's a verse on the mitzvah of Nazil. Where's the mitzvah of Nazil? Sefer Bamidbar. Chapter 6, verse number 1 until verse number 21. The Midbar is numbers in English. And that's the mitzvah of Nazir. And over there, says Rabbeinu Yonah, we find that the primary concern of ones uh, that's a Nazir is that he's not allowed to drink wine and forget the law. And be led astray by a spirit of wantonness. As such, the Torah forbids him from anything that is produced by grapevine, from the seeds to the skin. All of this is done as a precautionary measure from him drinking wine. And therefore our sages commented similarly in the Midrash Shmot Rabbah chapter 16, uh, section 2. In so many words... Where do we learn that this verse is not only referring to a married woman that is your relative, but rather any married woman? Very simple. The Nazir, he's not allowed to drink wine. That's one of the things, the conditions of being a Nazir. Also not allowed to cut his hair. Not allowed to go to a funeral. But because this status of a Nazir is so extraordinary... And obviously, he doesn't want to fail, and he's not allowed to fail, because this is a mitzvah that he took upon himself, it's a vow that he took upon himself. The Torah says, not only is he not allowed to drink wine, he's not even allowed to consume anything that has connection to grapes. Can't have the peel, can't have anything that has grapes in it. Yeah, but that's not wine. Exactly. Because if you get close to this, you're only a stone throw away from drinking wine. So in order for you not to go and pretty much put yourself in a really bad situation spiritually, it's better that you stay away and the Torah commands it. The same exact concept when it came to immorality, example that was mentioned by Yovani The Torah itself 
forbids you from the family relative, but also is to tell you that it's also referring to any married woman. One was the stated law, but it also branches out to other things. But it's the same exact Torah. So the Chacham and the Chachamim already show how they distinguish themselves in the way that they read the Torah and they learn the Torah. They're not just looking at things superficially. They're not ex- you know, extrapolating the meanings of the verses according to their understanding, but rather they're using specific laws that the Torah itself commands us to use in order to understand the Torah. And of course, it's not just to understand, oh, this seems similar. It has to have the same words. It has to begin in a certain way, end in a certain way. There are always, there are different types of rules of how they decided this is 100% guaranteed to be the meaning of a Torah. Not uh, possibly. There has to be not just similarities in understandings. Or, no, no. There has to be things that are identical about them. And of course, when you look at it in the Gemara, you see this one is using the same exact word here. And we learn that this word only means that. And therefore, anyone that learns Gemara understands exactly what I'm saying. Anyone who doesn't perhaps does not understand this part, but understands everything else that I say, you could simply know that this is the case. So already we see that Shlomo HaMelech is not just wise because of this super knowledge that he got that was, let's say, the equivalent of a million books that if somebody had the time they could ever get to. No, no. Shlomo HaMelech had wisdom that's superior to others in both areas, whether it be the book knowledge or the knowledge of the heart. How to be able to implement this knowledge in his dealings with people. And that's exactly what Chachamim are able to do. When they learn Torah, they're able to use the character traits they've developed, the understanding of other people's hearts and other people's situations and circumstances, the understanding of the plain case in front of them, and then the answer that many times comes from what seems to be an unrelated source for the answer. We gave an example of this Years ago, in the name of Ravel Yashiv, where one that was that asked him a question, Ravel Yashiv gave him the answer that he never underst- he didn't understand. How could you get? Why do I have to do this just because of this donkey? Why do I have to 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 go and help this person that I don't like just because of this donkey that's mentioned in the Torah? He says because the Torah is specifically saying go help the donkey of the one that you don't like. Not because the one that you don't like isn't necessarily in a worse shape than the one that you do like, the person you do like, but rather because helping the person that you don't like is also helping yourself because it requires you to overcome your flawed character traits. When a person sees that particular shiur and how Rabbi Yashiv, when we broke it down in that shiur, I don't want to repeat the whole thing. It's literally, you understand, the mind of a chacham, it's not like us. It's not like regular people. Chachamim, they see the world differently. It's like they have x-ray, MRI, CAT scan vision of the world. And they're able to see the world from the eyes of the Torah. Furthermore, the Radak says the breath of heart, 
the immense knowledge that he had is compared to sand. It seems that this is a sand and trees don't necessarily go together as far as comparisons where Shlomo Amelech's knowledge is compared to that and the Radak says that there are many facets of wisdom as there are grains of sand in the seashore and Shlomo Amelech's fund of knowledge had so much breath that he was expert in all of them and just as the seashore is a boundary that prevents the ocean from flooding the land so is Shlomo's wisdom restraining him from indulging in any desires that were opposite of the will of God so here we see that again the analogies that are brought in the verse have very, very deep meanings that require wisdom to understand as well. Because if you read it simply, it's like, oh, well, there's grains of sand. Okay, so you had a lot of knowledge. But what does that have to do with the seashore? Obviously, the seashore has sand. Why do I need to repeat it? Furthermore, the Emek Sheila says... While a truly wise person does not flaunt what he knows, he shows his knowledge when necessary, to the degree that it's needed. Just like the sand restrains the sea from excess and from flooding the world, as the Gemara says, every wave that comes to the seashore wants to drown the world. But there's an angel that Hashem sends to every wave and says, stop, stop. And every wave stops and just like the sand that restrains the sea from excess Shlomo HaMelech's good taste regulated how and when he displayed his unlimited knowledge now Shlomo is being compared to a Tan the Israelite a man of and Kalkol some say that these were some very righteous people among Am Yisrael that lived in the previous generation. So much so that, that uh, Iman and Eitan, they were the ones that wrote Psalms number 88 and 89. Others say that it's really comparing Shlomo to Avraham, who is called here Eitan the Israelite, meaning the powerful one from the east and, and Moshe Rabenu, who is called Heman meaning Neeman the trusted one Kalkol is Yosef meaning the uh, the provider of all Darda is the uh, Dora Dea the generation of knowledge Machol is all of Am Yisrael because Hashem forgave all of Am Yisrael uh, for the uh, golden calf sin, Mechila. Whether it's this or it's that or it's both, the point being is Shlomo Amelech's wisdom was superior. But again, there is a certain type of wisdom. It's wisdom of Torah, no one in the world ever surpassed Moshe Rabbeinu. The Zohar Kadosh says, the Rosh HaNevi'im, the head of all prophets, was Moshe Rabbeinu, Rosh, Rosh HaKodesh, Rosh HaKedusha, the, the head of Rosh HaKodesh, was David HaMelech, Shlomo HaMelech's father. But wisdom, we have here Shlomo in comparison to all, but the uh, uh, Moshe. Anyway, the Torah here tells us, the book of Kings, some examples of Shlomo's uh, wisdom that he composed thousands of proverbs. What was the message in these proverbs? 
3,000 Proverbs. We don't have 3,000 Proverbs from Shlomo. We only have the ones that were divinely inspired. Meaning it did not come from his wisdom only, but rather divine inspiration. And the Baal Metzudot says that the primary message of Proverbs by Shlomo Melech, anyone that reads it and understands what Shlomo Melech is saying, the primary message is for people to fear God. Why? Reshit Chochma Yirat Hashem. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of Hashem. That's the beginning of wisdom. So if you want to benefit from my wisdom, Shlomo Melech is saying to you, you have to fear Hashem. You don't fear Hashem, you're not going to understand anything else that I'm saying. Now why write Proverbs in the first place? Why do I need Proverbs? Why did Shlomo Melech write Proverbs? You could just simply tell people, fear Hashem 3,000 times. Reword it a few other times. Variations. Why in a proverb? Because the wisdom of Torah is beyond human comprehension. And Shlomo HaMelech, who had the unparalleled ability to present, he knew the wisdom of people, ability of people, flaws of people, desires of people. Again, he had chokhmat alev, he had the wisdom of the heart. Because he had this wisdom, he knew that this important information, that's the word of God, has become incomprehensible to many people that have not sanctified themselves and therefore he presented in such a way that through pro- proverbs and parables the people could read it and understand it at their own level where you could if you are just beginning you could see the verse see what it says and understand a certain part of the message if you are more clever, more wise, more learned, you'll understand even further. The more wisdom of Torah you have, the more wisdom of Torah you're gifted by God, the more knowledge you will get from the very same words. The deeper the information. Now, the Degel Machane Ephraim is telling us that a typical genius is not able to relate to children. Whereas a person that's of average intelligence cannot gain any respect from br- of the brilliant people. Why? Because he's average. Shlomo HaMelech's wisdom of the heart was able to bridge the two and teach everyone. Meaning, whether you were the biggest chachamim in the world, in the world of Torah, biggest experts in archaeology from any country, any nation, biggest experts in the wisdom of witchcraft, biggest expert in the uh, trees and, 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 and botanical knowledge, biology, science, whatever it was, didn't matter who you were. Shlomo Melech was able to connect to everyone and teach everyone. And that's why it says, He spoke of the trees where he instructed people about the scientific and medicinal properties of each species of flora and fauna. Where he understood the underlying reasons of the Torah's laws regarding all creatures. He understood why we shecht we slaughter the cow and the chicken in order for it to be kosher. But fish, we don't slaughter. He understood the depth of the law. And while all wisdom is from Hashem, and His gift of wisdom 
is what enabled Shlomo HaMelech to know and understand everything from the source. Shlomo's wisdom was superior even to that of angels. And that's what allowed him to understand the source of knowledge from trees and animals, witchcraft, and everything else. So here we see that while none of us are Shlomo Melech or even the dust under his feet, we see that the common denominator among Shlomo and his indisputable wisdom and the wise men of the Torah is that they're able to use the same exact Torah that seems related or unrelated to practical issues and bringing it in such a fashion where it's as clear as day as this is the answer. Now, of course, we can't just leave Shlomo without seeing another example of his wisdom. Book of Proverbs, chapter 10, verse number 8. Shlomo says, Chacham Lev Ikach Mitzvot, Vevil Sfataim Yilavit. The wise of heart will seize mitzvot, good deeds, good deeds in the eyes of God. But the foolish one's lips will become weary. Shlomo Amelech is telling us, the wise of heart will seize mitzvot is that a wise person, a person that has not just wisdom of economics and finance, artificial intelligence, archaeology, science, but someone that has chokhmat alev, chokhmat alev means they understand how to connect all the dots. They are evaluating things based on not only where they are, and where they were, but where they're going, and how it will affect you, how it will affect the future, how it will affect their partners, their friends, their siblings, their uh, spouses, and everything else. They're looking at things all-encompassing. A wise person will search for opportunities. This type of white person will search for opportunities to do good deeds even when he has no immediate obligation to do so. Why? Why, would he, why? why is this wise of heart connected to mitzvot? Wise of heart, okay, give us some answers. Perhaps he can give us some Torah knowledge, and he can also teach us some business. Perhaps he can teach us some business, and he can also teach us about, I don't know, history. No, no, no. The one that's wise of heart, he is always looking for mitzvot. Even when he doesn't have to. He's looking for mitzvot. Why? Because his wisdom of the heart puts him in a position that's very precarious where he's constantly contemplating about the shortness of life and the inevitability of death that will spur him on to uh, to amass many merits. Meaning that because he's thinking about wait, I'm here today. I have no guarantee I'll be here tomorrow. And even if I'm here tomorrow, that's not a long time. Even if I'm here for another year, that's not a long time. Because after I'm finished with this time here, however long it is, after this is forever. After this life is forever. Is a judgment of what's going to happen forever. So what's 50, 70, 80, 120 years in comparison to forever? A million years is not even the beginning of forever. Forever is a big number. 
forever is never ending. So whether I'm here for another day, another month, another 50 years, it's minute, it's inconsequential in comparison to the forever that I have waiting for me. And what I have waiting for me is based on what I do with the limited amount of time that I have here. And since the time is so limited, even if it's not a day or a week or a month, even if it's a hundred years, and it may not be a hundred years, it may literally be another week or a month or or 20 years. Either way, it's small. Why? Because I need forever to be good. I can't afford for it not to be good. Not good forever? That's a bad deal. That's a horrible situation. That's a terrible situation forever so i gotta do whatever i can to make that forever good and as good as can be so what can i do who could i learn from who could i teach who could i give who could i help what can i do to constantly gather more mitzvot hence shlomo amelech says chacham lev yikach mitzvot because he's wise of the heart, he's looking for mitzvot. It's one of the reasons why Shlomo was constantly teaching. It wasn't to show off his knowledge, but rather to constantly share this knowledge in order to sanctify the glory of God. One of the examples that Rashi brings of someone that applied this to their life is Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu, when all of Am Yisrael was gathering the gold from the Egyptians, Moshe Rabbeinu, was the ultimate Chacham Lev. What did he do? He went to do a mitzvah of gathering the bones of Yosef at Tzadik because there was a promise made to Yosef. Yeah, but why don't you get some money first? No, no, no. Moshe says, listen, they want to go gather money. They want to gather gold. No problem. There's no problem with what they're doing. They can gather gold. That gold may help them in this world, however long they have in it. I'm not planning for this world. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I'm not working for this world. I have no idea how much time I have left in this world. It may be a week, it may be a month, it may be 120 years. But regardless of how long it is, it's inconsequential in comparison to forever. And that forever is not going to be affected by the gold I have here. It will be affected by the mitzvah that I'm doing. Because whether someone dies a billionaire or broke, that forever doesn't change as far as how many mitzvot he has. Because whatever mitzvot he has, whatever good deeds he has, that's what he has. In fact... Some of the worst words are said about people that die with an extraordinary wealth and did not do enough good in this world to publicize Torah. And the Chafetz Chaim said it and is quoted in the Ikvita the Meshicha of his Talmid Muvak, Arav Vassaman, where he said that the people that will be punished in some of the worst ways are the rich people that did not publicize the Torah enough did not support the Torah. They only used their wealth to buy more private jets and companies to go to and to show off with and more watch collections. Why? Because you are given a gift to publicize Torah and you didn't. So Moshe Rabbeinu says, I want to do whatever I can to prepare my forever. Yeah, but maybe you're going to live another 50 years. You're going to need money to live. Moshe Rabbeinu says, no, no, you're not understanding. If HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave me what I needed to eat today, why wouldn't he give it to me tomorrow? Then you're going to say, yeah, but he gave it to you. You didn't go take it. No, 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 you're not understanding. If he gave me what to eat today, Instead of me going to go and chase and go look for more gold, I'm showing him that I'm going to go look for more mitzvot 
more ways to sanctify his name, more ways to fulfill his Torah, more ways to show the world what's really important. The forever is important, not the here today is important. You think he's going to punish me by not giving me what to eat tomorrow for that? Because I went to do more mitzvot, instead of go to chase money, he's going to make me starve to death? Does that seem like a good God to you? Yeah, but there's plenty of people that know a lot of Torah and learn a lot of Torah and they're struggling. Sure, there are plenty of people that have a lot of money and they're struggling too. There's plenty of people that struggle, even being in the middle. Sometimes they have, sometimes they don't have. Everybody struggles. A Kadosh who gives each person the test they need, the test they deserve. But you're never going to get punished for doing the will of Hashem. Moshe Rabbeinu says, A Kadosh who gave me what to eat today. That's a, give me food so I could go serve him. How am I serving him by collecting gold? I'm not. I'm serving myself. I don't want to serve myself. I can. I'm allowed to serve myself and go to collect gold, but I don't want to. I want to be someone that is a chacham lev, wise heart that thinks about consequences, thinks about the ultimate goal of everything, the meaning of life. And therefore, I conclude that to go to fulfill the mitzvah of gathering the bones of Yosef is much more valuable and important than to go to collect more gold. And ultimately we see that that's exactly the case as the Kadosh Baruch Hu testified and put multiple verses in the Torah to say so. And from there we learn what is a Chacham Lev in action. Moshe Rabbeinu was a Chacham Lev. And guess what? Moshe Rabbeinu became rich in money anyway. Why? HaKadosh Baruch Hu made Moshe Rabbeinu extraordinarily wealthy. Not only was he the king, not only was he the prophet, but HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave him the bits and pieces of the Ten uh, Commandments that broke, and he was able to make a fortune out of them. So he was not only wealthy in mitzvot, he was wealthy even in material that's temporary. No one ever loses by being a chacham lev. And therefore, Rabotai, Shlomo HaMelech does not leave us with just the chacham lev. He says, who's not a chacham lev? Unfortunately, the majority of society can be. Why? He says, the foolish one's lips become weary. Who is this foolish one? Who is this foolish one? It's a person that wearies his lips by speaking so much and doing little. We're unlike the wise person who seizes every opportunity to do good deeds. He just talks about them. And the Me'iri adds to what the Mitzudot just said and says that the fool... literally becomes perverted by his own words. He stumbles on what he says. He acts impetuously. And he will always be indecisive. Whereas the wise person that performs the mitzvot without delay, the foolish one speaks about doing them, but always procrastinates. And with such an t- attitude, he will stumble and never do them. This happens, unfortunately, very often, very often, where people say things without realizing that Shlomo HaMelech just stamped their statement, if not them themselves, as fools. Why? You missed the message. You missed the message. Shlomo HaMelech says, focus on mitzvot. Focus on doing what's in your hands, what's within your ability. And you're saying, no, 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 but I want to do this, but I want to do this, but I want to do this, when I can do this, when I can do this, when I can do this. You're not getting the point. What you are judged on 
is what is within your ability to do. You're not judged on what's beyond your ability to do. So that's why for the first comment where a person says, I want to convert right away, ACP, or I wish it was like, you know, it used to be where you just go and convert right away on the same day. First of all, you're not understanding how conversion was done back then and how things were back then. Back then, Jews were killed in the middle of the street for being Jews. If you still wanted to convert, they believed you because literally you were putting your life on the line. What Jew is putting their life on the line right now for being Jewish? What Jew? Oh, you say, well, the, the terrorist, there's anti-Semitism. Yes, there's anti-Semitism, there's terrorism, but in reality, you can walk around in most places around the world without being worried about the fact that you're Jewish. You can walk around with a kippah and a beard. You can walk around without a kippah and a beard. You can walk around wherever you want. You can go to a lot of different places in the world and do business and, and do all types of things. It's not dangerous to be Jewish. Perhaps there's risks, but there's also risks of simply being alive. You can be hit by a truck, you can get cancer, you get a lot of things. Who decides? But the situation of the world today is certainly better for the Jewish people than it was back then. Number two, you wanting to convert right now, right away, and you're, you're, you're upset that it's not like it used to be. You're not understanding the point of what you're doing even. Your main goal should be to gather as many mitzvot as possible. Learn all the things that are relevant to your conversion. Not things that are not relevant to your conversion. Like some people tell me, listen, um, I like to learn the Zohar a little bit. Or I like to learn Gemara. Is that okay even though I didn't convert? No, it's not okay. And obviously since you're doing it anyway, you don't really care what I say or what anybody says because you just decided to do it. In essence, what you're saying is that you already know all of the laws of blessings, all of the laws of Shabbat, all of the laws of holidays, and I can bet you as much as you want that you don't. Why? You don't even know most of these laws exist. Perhaps you know the 39 melachot by heart. Perhaps you know the 13 principles of faith. But that's what you think Judaism is? It's no wonder the door hasn't been opened yet. Because you don't understand what Judaism is yet. So if you're saying, oh, I want to convert ASAP, you're not understanding. Your main job should be do as much as you can. Do as much as you can. Learn as much as you can that's applicable to your situation today. The same thing goes for a Jew that's just a Baal Tshuva. The same thing goes for a woman that's trying to improve her marriage. The same thing goes for a man that's trying to, you know, do chinuch with his kids. Do as much as you can with what you have, with whatever tools you have. Don't hope for a different situation. Don't hope for the situation to change. You change. You do more with the tools you have. Oh, if I had a lot of money, I would give and I would do this. Stop telling us fairy tales. Do the best you can with what you have. You have two nickels to scratch? Go ahead. Make something with the new nickels. Make fire with it. Do something with it. You have an idea? Implement the idea. You have a blessing to make? Make the best blessing possible. It's time to pray. Pray like a mensch. Pray like a kadosh baruch is in front of you and not a wall. You have time. How do you have time? You should be learning Torah. You should be doing something with your life. Stop wasting it talking about all the things you want and the ideas of what if this was and what if that was. You're missing the point. You're missing the point. You're acting like a fool, says Shlomo HaMelech. Why? If you were Chacham Lev, if you were Chacham Lev, you would go and grab mitzvot, mitzvot, mitzvot. Not talk about things. Not wasting your time on comments and messengers and all types of online uh, uh, periodicals. Everybody's talking about their ideas. Who cares about the ideas? Go look at the ideas of the Chachamim. Oh, but I said this, and I saw this, and I want this, and I, who cares? Go learn. If you're not learning, go work. If you're not working, go learn. 
That's the point. So Shlomo HaMelech says, Chacham Lev, Yikach Mitzvot. You want to be a Chacham? Change your lifestyle. Stop talking about the things you want to do. Stop talking about the things you would do if such and such would happen. Go do the best you can with what you have in every aspect of life. People that talk about ideas generally never implement them. Why? They're too busy talking. They're too busy talking. In order to be a chacham, you also have to be a doer. Go do. Don't tell the world to change. You change. And you'll see the world around you change by default. So those that have the mentality of now, I need to do this now, you're missing the message. You're missing the message. And that's one of the things that you hear people say, and you say to yourself, how is this possible? This person has watched, has heard, has attended thousands of lectures, and he hasn't learned even the basics of wisdom of what a chacham is. How could this be? And this is not one person I'm talking about, two or three or five. This is literally examples from countless people over a decade. People, Jews and Gentiles, do not understand what Torah is. They don't understand what a chacham is. Why? They ask a question after they do something. If you really wanted the knowledge of the chacham, you would ask before you do something. Or they ask the questions that they decide the chacham knows about. Meaning, they'll go to the chacham and say, listen, uh, in regards to pots and pans and kashrut, that you know. I decided what you know, so I'm going to ask you about that. But in regards to my business, in regards to my marriage, in regards to which yeshiva to take my kids to, in regards to, you know, the, the big deal all about the sign, that stuff, I don't need to involve the rabbis. I don't need to involve the chachamim. Why? They don't know business. They don't know. What do they know? They know books. You, my dear friend, do not know what a chacham is. You don't know what a chacham is. Let me give you guys an example. Let me give you guys an example. A thousand years ago, there was a book I've been mentioning more often in the last several lectures. Besiyat Dishmaya. A book called Chovot Alevavot. The Duties of the Heart. And we'll see how in three completely separate places, the Chacham connects the dots. In Shara Yichud, the unity of God, chapter 10, he writes, that we all agree that it was necessary that it was necessity that brought us to anthropomorphize, anthropomorphize the Creator, may be exalted, and describe Him in terms of attributes properly belonging to His creatures, in order to offer a conception that would help establish the notion of God's existence in the minds of men. The books of prophets express this for people in corporal language, which is closer to their thinking and more intelligible to them. Had they described God in strictly spiritual terms and concepts, we would have understood neither the terms nor the concepts. It would have been impossible for us to worship a being whom we did not know, since the worship of that which is unknown is impossible. It was therefore essential that the terms and the concepts be geared to the level of understanding of the listener. See here the Chobot HaLevavot is telling you why is the Torah speaking to Hashem as if he's a human being? He saved Am Yisrael with a strong arm. You know, he was angry. He loved us. All types of terms like this that make him sound like a human. 
The reason why is not because he's human, chas v'shalom, but rather because he himself in his endless, infinite wisdom knew that unless he described himself in such a fashion, we would not know what to worship and how to worship him. So he had to use a language that his creation was able to understand. Fine. Had he done otherwise, we simply would not be able to serve him because it is impossible for somebody to serve a creator he doesn't know. That's the first point. Second point. In Shara Prina, chapter 5, the Chavot HaLevot says the following. When we see any of the architectural works of the ancients, we are amazed by their ability to accomplish such feats, that they build themselves such imposing strongholds, teaches us of their physical strength and their self-dignity. Now, if such diminutive and insignificant work, only slightly superior to our own, looms so large in our sight, how much more so should we wonder at the creator of heaven and earth and all that is therein, who created them all without effort or exertion, labor or fatigue, out of nothing and compelled by nothing, but only by his will and wish. As it says in the Torah, by the word of God, the heavens were made, by the breath of his mouth, all his, their host. So here, the Chavot HaLevavot is telling us, you want to be amazed by this creator that you used human language to describe? You don't have to see all of his creations and understand all of his creations. You can look at whatever's in front of you. You have a monitor in front of you? Do you know how much knowledge had to be put into putting that monitor together? How many people had to work on it with different ideas, semiconductors, motherboards, memory, pixels, glass, plastic, all types of things just to make the monitor, the microphone, the bottle of water, the, the books, Anything that you have next to you, if you really think about all of the different people that had to be involved in order to bring whatever creation you have in front of you, if you truly understood what it took to make a sandwich, simply a sandwich, what sandwich do you like? Tell me, what do you like? A schnitzel sandwich? Let's think about a schnitzel sandwich. I've given this example before. Let's think how they make a schnitzel sandwich. Well, first, you need to have... A chicken, so you can slaughter it. But before the chicken comes the egg, in case somebody didn't know. The original chicken came as a chicken, though. Why? A Kadosh Baruch created everything ready. After that, chicken, egg, chicken, egg. So now, you need a chicken, lays an egg. But somebody has to watch the chicken. Somebody has to collect the egg. Somebody has to decide to make sure that they're compliant with all of the laws of their country, of their society, to make sure that they're able to sell those eggs. Somebody has to be willing to buy the egg. Somebody has to make equipment in order to transfer the eggs, in order to preserve the eggs, in order to eventually sell the eggs to a reseller who resells it, who eventually gives it and sells it to the actual market that actually publicizes it. Now, somebody has to work for a publishing company, a marketing company, newspaper, websites, all types of people have to work in order for them to have a business that they're now able to also publicize that the eggs are on sale at such and such supermarket. Oh, the supermarket. You know how many supermarkets there are? Many. Do you know what their profit margin is? Approximately 3%. It's not a very profitable business, by the way. But needless to say, large volume and the world needs it. Point being is, these supermarkets, they sell a whole load of products. They sell the chicken egg. They sell uh, all types of vegetables. They sell bread. Oh, you need the bread. Of course you need the bread. You need farming. You need somebody to go plant the seeds, somebody to harvest, somebody to collect, somebody to do all of these different things, then eventually turn that into 
the obvious materials in order to make bread instead of making something else. Now you harvest it, you wait in the season, you did everything you needed to do. Now you collected it, but you don't really want to make bread. You just want to sell this whole harvest that you have. Somebody has to be willing to be in the business of just buying what you have. Now he needs to get to you. You know how he needs to get to you? He needs to go on a truck. He can't just walk to you. You're too far away. Somebody has to make a car, but they're not just going to make one car. They have to make a whole lot of cars and to make a whole lot of cars, a lot of money. So you know how much money we need for cars? Tons and tons of money. That's why you need Wall Street. Wall Street raises money. Where does Wall Street get the money from? Billionaires, millionaires, and people that want to be there. You know how they made their money? They sold the chicken egg. They sold the tractor. They sold the car. They sold all types of things. They got some money. They saved it in the bank instead of spending it. And eventually they called Mr. Broker or Hedge Fund or whatever, Mutual Fund, and they invested the money. Oh, investing the money. You know how hard it is to invest money? How can you invest money? What, do you send it in an envelope? No! You do it on a computer. How do you get a computer? You buy a computer. A company needs to decide to make computers. Do you know how many parts are in a computer? This computer that I have literally looks like a rocket ship. It has the motherboard. It has the memory. It has all types of chips, all types of lights. Everybody has a different manufacturer, whether it's the graphics card or it's the processor or it's all types of things. And each one of these companies has to have thousands upon thousands of employees that have to wake up early in the morning and go to work and do their job. And then somebody, somebody out of every one of those company has to publicize this job, this end product, so it can get to the computer store, so the computer store can get to the consumers. First, to the marketing company. The consumer gets it, he buys the computer. He then buys the computer, invests into a stock. That money goes to the broker. First, he has to call him. He has to talk to him. How does he get to him? He has to get to, to the telephone company, AT&T, Verizon, or whoever it is in your country. But needless to say, somebody has to put the lines under the ground in order to have the phones work. But not today. That was yesterday. Today, it's satellites. They have to go to outer space just for you to make a phone call so you can call the broker, so you can make an introduction, waste about 45 minutes of your life just to make a small stock transaction and maybe buy a mutual fund. So one day you'll have some more money. Now somebody has to decide to be the broker, to be the fund manager, to be the guy, but where is he gonna be? In the streets? No, he has to be in a building that has a bunch of other people. Where is he gonna get the building? Someone has to build the building. Build a building? Why would you want to build a building? Because people need to go into a building. Now, how are you going to build a building? You need construction workers. Construction workers, where are they going to build? We're going to build all types of stuff. Where are you going to get the stuff? From the steel manufacturer. And all the guys that deal with all the asphalt and all the uh, different types of materials, the stones, the sheetrock, the lighting. Oh, yeah, yeah, so many people just for a building for this one broker. No, it's not one broker. It's a bunch of brokers. And then you build a building in hopes that the brokers eventually move in. And not just the brokers for stocks and bonds, but maybe some insurance, maybe some guys that are dentists. Hopefully there's a lawyer because some of them are going to need it. And needless to say, we need some other people that do something else. Perhaps they'll be the customers. Either way, we build a building that people fill up the buildings every suite or at the very least 75 occupancy rates so the building stays in business and doesn't default on the loan. Oh, the loan? Yeah, the loan. Why? You need to pay for the building. How are you going to pay for the building? You got to borrow the money. From who? From the lender. Why would anybody lend you any money? Because that's their business. They lend you the money in order for them to collect an interest on the money that they're lending you. Where do they get the money? From the investors. What investors? Wall Street. Again, Wall Street. We didn't start with Wall Street. We're still at the building. Exactly. It's all connected. For what? The chicken egg. The chicken egg you want to eat. The chicken egg needs so many different people just for the chicken egg. When you understand just a little bit of what I just explained, you realize literally... The system we have in the world, whether you are in Russia or Ukraine, whether you are in Iraq or America, wherever you are in the world, the system we have in place is extraordinary. 
and it's still nothing in comparison to the mechanism that makes your eye. It's still nothing in comparison to this globe that stores all of it. It's still nothing in comparison to one ray of light that comes from the sun. It's still nothing in comparison to the most monumental of creations, the atom. And of course, the parts that make the atom. And the 99% of it, that's nearly zero, nothing. The point being is, when you see whatever is your life, and you realize, wow, all of that and more has to happen just for me to have a chicken sandwich, and we didn't even go into everything? Wow. What about the rest of this world? So now, a person that sees the architecture of this world, the makeup of the world in front of them, doesn't need to know the details of all of creation in order to be even more amazed. Who is not amazed? Someone who simply doesn't want to be. He doesn't want to be amazed. Doesn't want to be enamored. Doesn't want to admit that there's someone above him that obligates him. Since you benefit from this world and you're going to eat that chicken sandwich, you have to comply by the law of the one who created it all. Someone who doesn't want to comply with that will eventually comply with it other ways. But here it says, Rabbeinu Bichayeh, in Chovot HaLevavot nearly a thousand years ago, this extraordinary God that we could not even get to, we couldn't even get to any of his creations, we could only talk about the chicken and the chicken egg. We can't even go into the details of what makes the atom, of what makes the sun, of what makes the world nothing. We're still dealing with a chicken egg. So it had to be explained in human language in order for you to comprehend, in order for you to know your own insignificance, but also your own debt and how much you owe him and how much part of that debt is your obligation to love him and how much of a reason you have to love him. If you contemplate the marks of wisdom in the created things you will find that besides testifying to the divinity and the oneness of the creation of the creator they're also without exception useful in various ways to man for his benefit and while some of these uses are manifest others are obscure where he gives for example light light is easy to to, you know, see how useful it is. But people don't realize how useful darkness is. So much so that without it, the world could not exist. Because without darkness, we would not be able to decipher when it's time to rest. And we would all die young and not even old enough to reproduce. Without darkness, the world simply would not be able to exist. Now the third point comes at a completely different chapter in serving God, chapter 8. And the Chavot HaLevavot says, We observe in many material devices functions regarding which had we not seen them with our own eyes but only heard of them by report, we would quickly declare the one who told us about them a liar. Take, for instance, the measuring device that was used by astronomers. If we had never seen this instrument with our eyes, but someone had told us of its form and appearance and what could be apprehended through it, of the movements of the spheres, the position of the stars, the precise determination of each of the seasons, the distance between disparate things and many other facts, that would otherwise be unknown to us, we would have no clear conception of it, nor could we form a picture of it in our minds. And the same is true of something more familiar to us. 
which is in which is in common use, such as the balance, the scale. For had we not perceived it with our sense of sight, we would not have thought it conceivable that one could weigh truly with a scale in which one part is longer than the other. And what is still more su- surprising on this scale is that how a single stone can measure the varying weights that are much more significant than it. So here he's giving you some examples of different things of the world that until you see it, it's impossible for you to believe that it ever exists. A scale, this tiny little thing can measure something so much bigger. How? Why? This tool, you can see the stars? No, come on, why? Until you see it, it's impossible to believe without blind faith. A good example of it was there was once a video, semi-entertaining, but very, very useful, where young kids from this generation, teenagers, were shown a rotary phone that we used as kids. Rotary phone. Today, people don't know what a rotary phone is, unless they're old like us. But the parents gave a rotary phone to the kids, and the kids had no idea what this is. They told them it's a phone. Like, well, how do you dial? They started pressing the circle. They couldn't figure out. You have to spin Each one to get to the end, that's one, another one, that's nine, that's one, another one, and so on. They couldn't figure it out. They couldn't figure out how to use a rotary phone that was standard technology for their parents. That was standard technology for me, that was standard technology for many people. Even though they're so superior in their modern day technology, they're not capable of understanding how something that was standard technology just a generation ago or less. They can't comprehend it. So we see what the Chavot and Levavot is saying here is that many times we think of things as impossible until we see them. And even if one believes, oh, this is, yeah, this, I understand, this, this, this works. You don't really know how it works, but you believe it works. Why? You've gotten used to the system. Where it tells you, if expert tells you it works, then it works. Expert tells you, take this, you take it. Expert tells you, go, you go. And that works, generally speaking, with a lot of things, except with the Torah. Experts tell you to do stuff. Now, let me check. I'm going to get a second opinion. I'm going to ask a different rabbi. And therefore, it says, the Chavot de Levot, if we are ignorant of ordinary accessible things, it's not surprising that we do not understand the workings of the predetermination and justice and the exalted creator's judgment. These being infinitely more hidden and sublime than the things mentioned above. In a similar vein, David Melech said, God, my heart is not haughty. My eyes are not raised high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and mysterious for me. In Psalm 131 verse 1. He followed this with a related statement on submission to God, saying, Surely I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. My soul is with me like a weaned child. Here David Melech tells us the secret to his success in serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He did not understand everything. He simply believed whatever Hashem said. A person that wants to be a chacham has to understand that there are going to be a lot of things that you're not going to understand. Not just in the Torah, in life in general. When a person asks you to invest into something, you could just do just so much research, but you're truly not going to understand until you get your hands dirty and get get it working. A person asks you, let's get married, You're not going to know how it's going to work out until you're actually in it. Everything in life, there's an element of trust. There's an element of faith in it. There's an element of risk. And people are willing to take that risk when it comes to 
everything except God. Except God. I said, no, no, I love God. I trust God. If you trust God, that means you have to trust his messengers. And if you don't trust the messengers, that means that you think you know more than the messengers. And that makes God a liar. Why? Because he said that he'll never leave us without the messengers. He'll never leave us with people that are not going to tell you what is the Torah. The Torah cannot live without Chachamim. The Torah cannot live without the Chachamim. One of the extraordinary examples that we saw of is about the Jews that lived through communism. When some of these extraordinary tzaddikim from America and Israel, mainly America, went to Russia during its communist days to go and see what they can do to help the Jewish people that were forbidden from practicing Judaism. They arrived at a place where literally Jews did not know how to practice Judaism, even if they wanted. There was some tzaddikim inside Russia, despite the terrorism of, of the government and the communism, that wanted Judaism. This one tzaddik, Rabbi Eliyahu Essas, and in, in Russia, and Rabbi Neustadt in America, literally they formed this partnership where they constantly sent people to help them, teach everybody. They started a whole revolution. By the time the, the, the Iron Wall broke, you had a bunch of people practicing Judaism. But still, the journey itself tells you what happens when there's no Chachamim. There's one place called Cuba where there were literally over 6,000 Jews there. 6,000 Jews! They knew they were Jews. They were proud of their Judaism. They lived on the other side of the river again. You know, the Muslims were on one side, the Jews were on the other side. But there were no Chachamim because the communists came into town one time. On Shabbat, there were 13 synagogues at the time. All the businesses were, were closed. The communists got so angry, they killed every one of the rabbis. Except one who was the old man. Twelve rabbis, twelve synagogues, all died. Why? Because all the stores were closed and they couldn't buy cigarettes. And when that rabbi, the old man, died, there were no chachamim left to teach anyone Torah. And within a short period of time, literally 30, 40 years, the Jews of Cuba over there literally thought that as long as you don't light the candles on Friday, Shabbat never comes in. And they were always afraid that the communists would come and they would have to do a melacha, so they never lit the candles and they thought that's how you keep Shabbat, by not lighting the candles. They thought all types of things that were literally not even close not even close to what Torah said. Not because they meant evil. Not because they didn't care. They were more proud of their Judaism than you and I. They were willing to die for their Judaism. But they had no clue what it said. Why? Because there was no Chachamim. There was no one to tell them what it says. And within a short period of time, no one knew anything. They just remembered some stuff. They remembered some customs, they remembered some things, but they had so many confusions that literally when the Vaad came, they literally had to build everything from scratch and some extraordinary Talmidei Chachamim came from there. Some extraordinary Talmidei Chachamim came from there. And they made major sacrifices just for the sake of the Torah. So you see Rabotai Karim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, says to us, we have rules in the Torah. You're not always going to understand all the rules. In fact, most of the time you won't. In fact, most of the time, you may not even know they exist. Just like you don't know how the egg travels all the way to your sandwich and what it entails in order for you to eat it, 
just like you don't know how all of these different technologies and antibiotics or telescopes or cars and all types of other things that are out there that are part of our day-to-day life you don't know how they all work but you rely on a system just like you don't understand god himself and the torah needs to minimize in essence the glory of god by humanizing him and using specific terms for us to understand you also have have to understand in order for us to understand even the human terms even the anthropomorphosis even the basic laws of blessings of shabbat of rosh chodesh of conversion of tshuva of anything has to be by the chachamim but if you don't trust the chachamim that they're truly chachamim then you're not going to use them for the right things if you think that the chachamim only know about the laws of the Torah, that means you don't believe in the Chachamim. Because if someone is a Chacham, they're able to connect all of the things you know of to the things they know of and also the things that you don't know of to the things you don't know that they don't that they know of. Meaning that everything you know they also know how to do better why power of torah and we'll finalize with an example years ago there was a chacham named rav eliezer silver and he told of a story that happened to him in his life when he was a young man he went to go visit, he was a Bachul, learning, Tamit Chacham, and he went to visit Rav Gozinski. Rav Chaim Ozer Gozinski was the Gdol Ador. His house was open practically 24 hours a day as people from all over the world would come to him, asking him questions and guidance about everything. A team from Poland would come. As they're leaving, a team from Russia is coming in. A group from a family in some part of Israel comes. A group from part of Africa leaves. People literally from all over the world will come to him asking for guidance, asking for psak halacha, asking for advice, asking for blessings. Chafetz Chaim called him Gdol So this, Rav Eliezer Silver comes to visit his rabbi and as soon as he comes in, the house is full of people. And as soon as the Rav Chaim Ozer sees him, he says, come, you want to take a trip? Let's take a trip together. A trip? So many people in the house. Let's go take a trip. And they start walking. And they're walking, and they're walking, and they're walking. And you know, a young man, Rav Eliezer Silver, maybe the rabbi needed some fresh air, so he's taking me along with him, make me feel good. And they keep walking and walking, and they're going into the woods. Woods? Why is the rabbi taking me to the woods? The rabbi needs a uh, special air that's coming from the trees. Like, why, is, why are we in the woods? As they're going into the woods, and they're walking literally into the woods, Rav Chaim Moser points at one direction, and he says to Rav Eliezer, you see that beautiful mushroom over there, purple? Says, yeah. Because it's beautiful, right? Yeah, really beautiful, yeah. He's like, not, not sure. Why is the rabbi telling me about, uh, am I learning about mushrooms right now? Am I going to become a chef? Am I gonna, why, is he, why is the rabbi telling me about mushrooms? He doesn't ask. It's in his mind. He says, it's beautiful, right? But you can't eat it. It's poisonous. Ah, okay. Thank you for the shiur Torah on the mushroom. You see that tree over there? See those leaves? Those leaves? They're edible. You can eat them. The leaves you can eat, mushrooms you can't. Okay, noted. That tree over there, it's got these little fruits. You can also eat them. You can also eat those. Keeps walking. Rav Silver is confused as can be. As Rav Chaim Moza points at different things, over there, those leaves, you can eat them. That fruit, dangerous, poisonous. That one is, all I stops, because you have a notepad. Because yeah, write down everything I'm saying and also draw pictures of the leaves. 
goes, Rabbi, I, I don't really need a, a lesson about plants. And write down everything I say. As if he didn't say anything. He just said, write down everything I say. Gdol Adol is telling you. Your rabbi is telling you to do something. You write it down. You're not really sure why he's teaching you botany. Why are you now drawing little pictures of leaves? Why he's telling you this will kill you, this will... What do you need to know all this for? The rabbi says, I do. He says, for hours we're in the woods. Hours. How does the Gdol Adol have this kind of time? How does he have this kind of time? There are hundreds of people waiting in the house to see him. He's with me. Baruch Hashem. Not sure what's going on. He says, after a few hours, we finish, we review the woods, have all types of insights, everything edible, everything poisonous. We go back. We part ways. I'm as confused as can be why the rabbi just taught me all of this. Some years passed, Rav Chaim Ozer died, went to Gan Eden. Rav Silver, on the other hand, went to the Holocaust. In the Holocaust, they were killing people by the hundreds. They were torturing people. They were starving people. Rav Silver was one in a small group that escaped the camp and went into the woods. Now they couldn't go too far away because they'll hit another camp. They couldn't go back because they'll get killed. How do you survive in the woods? He says, those lessons that Rav Chaim Ozer gave me many years before are the only reason we all survived because we knew what was edible, we knew what was poisonous. And we survived in the woods until the end of the Holocaust. We survived in the woods. How did Rav Chaim Ozer know this? Anyone who learns Masechet Kilaim will also know. But how did he know to connect this to this young man years before he needs it? That's the secret of a Chacham. Connect the things you know of, the things you don't know of, the things you don't even know that the Chacham can know of. And when a person knows what a Chacham is, they'll finally understand at least what the Torah can be and how they themselves can become a Chacham Lev. A Chacham Lev goes and gets mitzvot and does not worry about all the things that are beyond his reach, rather all the things that are within his reach, and focuses all of his or her energy on that. May be his will that all of us elevate ourselves to be Chachmei Lev. Kol Tuv, Bracha Ba'atzlacha. Thank you again for learning with me. May Hashem bless all of you and all of Am Yisrael. Holkenos asked him, what can we do to protect ourselves from Chavrei Mashiach? He says, Torah and Gemilut Chasadim. Even if somebody does a, a nice thing or learns a lot or anything like that, it's never compared to bringing one of Hashem's lost kids that's been lost for the last 3,000 years back home. One of the beautiful things that we have in our organization is that we have both Torah and Zikri Rabin because we have our Kolels, we have our Avrachim, and we also have our Kiruv that we do around the world. Our lectures reach every corner of the world, Baruch Hashem, in multiple languages, but of course, we always want to do even more.
יכול להיות שעכשיו אנחנו נשמע את השופעה של המשיח. נמצא איתנו כאן האורח מפלורידה, יושב ראש הארגון, מזכה הרבים, הרב ירון ראובן. בעזרת השם כולנו נעשה ונצליח ונגדל בתורה ונזכה את הרבים ונעשה כבוד שמיים כמו שצריך. עבדתם המלאי התורה, תמשיכו, תהיו אור גדול. למה ישראל, אדוני אלוהינו. בהזדמנות שאני אברך את הרב ירון רובן שהוא זקן את הרבים ומחזיק תורה בעם ישראל בארץ וגם בתפוצות אשרי אמר שלך לקרוא שימשיך עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה זכות גדולה מאוד שהוא מחזיק תורה בעם ישראל טוב, ש"סים נוספו הערב לעם ישראל לכבודה של תורה, להרמת קרנה של תורה וכל הדברים הללו ברוך השם הודות לידידנו יושב ראש הארגון שעוד לא ידע את ההפתעה שתכננתי לו While we have Kiruv work that we've done throughout the whole year, we also have the Torah that we're constantly producing more and more of, and last but not least, the uh, Chesed to feed the poor people in Israel. A very special thank you to all our amazing guests who show real love about this land by taking the time out of their busy schedule and sharing their ups and downs with us, all for the sake of our Israel. <laughs> One of the big things that we have, aside from this campaign, you probably see this poster or something similar to it, is also we published some of the recent results that we have, or at least up to now, of the organization. And one of the reasons why we do this each year is because we want to make sure that our partners, our donors, our Talmidim, know where their money is going. Unlike everybody else that, you know, uh, says a lot, does a lot, we want to show you what these results are. I can tell you from my experience and a little bit of knowledge about the whole Torah world, I don't know of anybody else, uh, any other organization on planet Earth that produces dollar for dollar what we've produced over these last few years. This is nothing to be arrogant about. It's simply Siyat Bishmai HaKadosh Baruch who helped us. We made every sacrifice that we can possibly make in order to, to make it happen. Producing nearly 300 films, publishing 32 books, our own books, giving out 154,000 books for free. Giving out 154,000 books is not a cheap endeavor. Anyone that wants to do such a thing has to be completely committed to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to his children, and most importantly, to have bitachon in HaKadosh Baruch Hu and his Torah. We also have fed over 160,000 people over these last several years. Each year during Pesach, the high holidays, throughout the year, we help a lot of people eat, help make sure that they have groceries, food, all types of things. And uh, you guys have seen many of the videos that are uh, that we've produced over the years to actually show you the people that are getting this food. You have here 160,000 people have eaten, nearly 300 Torah films. And then on top of all of it, we have 1.4 million USB CDs and cars that have been giving out for free. All of the work that we've done over the last 10 years on these USBs given out for free. Last but not least, 12,000 video and audio lectures available online in about 14 different languages for the world to watch for free. ארגון בעזרת השם לקח על עצמו את אחת המטרות הקשות ביותר בדור שלנו לתקן עולם במלכות שדי לא להסתפק במשהו אחד לעזור רק לאנשים מסכנים רק לאנשים ניצולי שואה רק לאנשים שלא מכירים את אלוקים רק לאנשים שאין להם כלום בבית אלא לעזור לכלל ישראל בכל מכל ברוך השם, חפץ השם בידינו הצליח למעלה ממיליון יהודים ויהודיות נעזרו על ידי ארגונים בעזרת השם. רק תדמיינו לכם איזה עוצמה היה לכל אחד ואחת מהשותפים שזכו להיות כל אחד כפי כוחו ויכולתו, לאיזה תוצאות הצליחו להגיע ולאיזה תוצאות עוד יצליחו. חרפור הוא שמח על לראות את השלטים, נעלה עכשיו למעלה, כמו קצת האש, את הלימוד. ברוכים הבאים, אפשר לראות כאן. כולם יושבים לומדים, איזה רעש של תורה, איזה רעש, איזה רעש, והנה יש פה עוד בית מדרש. וגם פה יש, השם הכל עמוס. פורים שמח, פורים שמח. דמיון הזה הוא לא דמיון כל כך רחוק, כי כמו שהתורה אומרת, בפיך או בלבבך לעשותו, ככה גם בדבר הזה. כל מי שירצה, כל מי שרוצה או רוצה להיות שותפים 
איתנו, עם הארגון הקדוש והנפלא הזה, שכל כוונתו לשם שמיים, להגדיל תורה ולהדירה, להרים קרן התורה, לעזור לכל אחד ואחד מעם ישראל, בכל העניינים, כל המישורים, מהילד הכי קטן, שצריך מטרנה וטיטולים, עד האיש הכי 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 מבוגר, שלעולם לא הניח תפילין, ורגע לפני המוות דואגים להניח לו תפילין. אם גם אתם רוצים להיות שותפים בכאלה דברים גדולים, בעשייה של תורה ועבודה וגמול חסדים, ברוך השם, ארגון בעזרת השם, כאן, לצדכם, לשירותכם, יחד עם כלל ישראל. כמעט מיליון וחצי דיסקים, דיסקונקים, שחילקנו, כל הדברים האלה בחינם, יותר מ-12 אלף שיעורים, אז כל הדברים האלה, מתי שבן אדם רואה כמה ההשקעה שלו, אם זה בבתים, מניות, בכל מיני דברים, והוא רואה שהמניה עלתה 10% במקום אחד, ו-1,000% במקום שני, אז הוא מבין איפה להשקיע פעם הבאה. ואותו דבר פה, יש הרבה אנשים שברוך השם צופים את השיעורים שלנו, שיעורים של הרב אפרים, שיעורים של הרב שרביט, ושאר הרבנים בארגון, ועכשיו זה הזמן להיות שותפים בדבר הגדול שאנחנו עושים ברוך השם. One of the reasons why we do this, why we show these numbers, is because we want to show everyone what we've done to give you an indication. an indication of what we can do in the future. So this is the time where we need as much of your help as possible to push yourself more than you typically do. If you typically donate a couple hundred dollars, donate a thousand. If you, uh, if you could afford uh, the uh, uh, 8,000, 15,000, 50,000, whatever you could afford, this is the time to do it because this is going to be the help that we have to help all of these Avachim, to feed these people and perhaps Bezat Hashem one day to get that building that we've been uh, wanting to, uh, to build here in, uh, in the United States to build a community. But the, all of these things require millions of dollars. If not now, then when?